welcome to our um, Promoting Yourself as an ECR event. Uh, so this event is being run by the community sites from the Company of Biologists. So that's Focal Plane, the Node and Prelights. Um, so we're going to kick off by telling you a little bit about what um, the Company of Biologists tries to do to promote ECRs and some opportunities that are available to you through the, through the company and then a little bit about our community sites. Then we'll move on to hear from our panelists, so they introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their, their careers and their involvement in ECR um, advocacy. And then we'll open the floor for um, questions um, from the audience. So if you can type your questions into the question and answer um, tab on, that you should be able to see on your screen now. And then after we, after we finish the um, panel discussion, then we'll move back into the out of this present presenter mode and into the uh, networking um, part of this Remo platform. And so hopefully there'll be some instructions popping up in the chat as to how you can navigate around that. But essentially there'll be tables that will appear on a floor plan and you'll be able to see yourself as a circle avatar and you can move around from table to table by, by clicking, double clicking on the table. Um, and this will give you the opportunity to meet other attendees, um, to meet the panelists, and also to meet representatives from the, the company of biologists as well. So we'd really encourage you to um, stay at the end and, and have a chat um, with everyone. Um, okay, so then moving on to discussion about the company of biologists. So, um, the company of biologists um, is a not-for-profit publisher. Um, we have uh, five journals in our in our collection that you can see here. But in addition to publishing the journals, the company of biologists also has some initiatives um, that are specifically directed at early career researchers. And so, first of all, just to define what we mean by early career researcher or ECR. So uh, this basically covers everyone up until the um, initial stages of their first independent position. So this can be from in, uh, undergraduate researchers, PhD students, postdocs, and yeah, as I said, research normally in a, roughly about the, the first three years of establishing their lab. And so as ECRs, there's a number of initiatives that the company of biologists that you're eligible to apply for. And so again, hopefully uh, some details of these will pop up in the chat so you can have, refer, to the, refer to the websites. Um, so we have some traveling fellowships where you can apply for funds to allow you to go and visit other labs. Um, our journal disease models and mechanisms have specific conference travel grants that you can apply for. And hopefully now we'll be able to use some of these to attend um, in-person meetings. And we also have funded places available at workshops. And then finally, I'd like to draw your attention to a new initiative from Biology Open, which is the Future Leaders Reviews. So this is where um, Biology Open invites early career researchers um, to propose reviews that they would like to write. So these reviews will then be peer reviewed and published in Biology Open with the ECR as the senior author. So hopefully you think this is a, agree with us that this is a great way to, to promote yourself as an early career researcher. And uh, Rachel Hackett, the managing editor for Biology Open and DMM, will be available in the networking event afterwards. So you'll be able to find a table labeled Biology Open. So she'll be able to answer any questions that you might have about this, in, this initiative. And so then moving on to the community sites. So as the community manager of the node, that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, so the node is a community site for developmental and stem cell biologists. And the content is largely driven by the community. And this is because anyone can publish, uh, anyone can um, uh, post on the site once they're registered. And so we hope this gives people, but particularly um, early career researchers, the opportunity to promote both themselves and their research. So this could be by sharing a blog post about your research story. So as a kind of behind the paper story, um, sharing um, any community news that's important to you or something about lab, about lab life. Um, in addition to uh, the blog post, we also have a thriving jobs board. And so here you can obviously look for your next job, but also you can um, advertise um, for new colleagues. And this might be particularly relevant for anyone um, who is starting their new lab. And so in addition to these things, the, the node also hosts the node network. And we're actually just celebrating the second uh, birthday of the node network. So it's almost exactly two years since the launch 
of the node network. So what is the node network? So the node network is a database of researchers in developmental and stem cell biology. And the idea is that anyone in the community can add themselves to this database and also search and use this database. And so the idea is that we want to expand the pool beyond the usual names that tend to be always invited uh, to be part of review panels um, and speakers at events and also to review papers. And so we'd really encourage you to add yourself uh, to this list, but also to use the list to search for people for your own um, events um, and, and seminars. Um, and the when people add themselves to the node network, they're invited to include diversity data as well. Uh, this is an optional an optional point. And then um, the database is fully searchable with diversity in mind or can be used exclusively scientifically. And at the two year point um, since the launch of the network, we're happy to say we now have over a thousand members from 44 countries. Um, but yeah, like I said, we'd really encourage you to, to sign up if you haven't done so already. And if you have any questions about this or um, about the node, then please come and chat with me in the networking session afterwards. So now I'll pass you over to Helen uh, Robertson Hill to tell you a little bit about Prelights. So as Helen said, I'm also called Helen and I'm the community manager for Prelights, which is the preprint highlighting initiative supported by the company of biologists. Um, and if you're not familiar with pre-lights and what we do, then I think this infographic shows that really nicely. So you can see um, at the centre of the picture there is our community of pre-lighters. And these are early career researchers, so predominantly PhD students and postdocs who advocate for pre-printing. And they select pre-prints that they're interested in from across the biological sciences from any pre-print server. It's mostly bio-archive that our pre-prints are highlighted from, but we don't mind which server you choose, any, any pre-print server is fine. So they select these preprints that they're interested in, and then our pre-lighters write a pre-lights post about that preprint. And this is a news and views type summary of the work. We're not prescriptive about what a pre-lights post look like, uh, looks like, but it normally includes some background or uh, context for the new research. It outlines the key findings of the preprint, but it also includes a personal perspective from the pre-lighter, so why they think it's interesting in relation to their work or interesting for the wider research community. And they also always include questions to the author of the preprint. And so before the pre-light is published on our website, the pre-light's post with those questions is sent to the author of the preprint. And they're always given the opportunity to answer those questions or to provide any additional insight to the work they've done. And that response is published alongside the pre-light's post on our website. And we're really excited and happy about the fact that in the last year, about two thirds of our pre-lights posts have author comments. And this is largely a very positive experience and interactions between pre-lighters and the authors of preprints is a really a positive thing to happen. And the authors are really glad that their work has been highlighted by pre-lighters for our website. And then once those posts are uh, printed on our pre-lights website, they're open for any readers to comment on. And we hope to you know, expand discussion on Twitter and share the work we're doing there too. So anybody can comment on them, interact, and we kind of hope to initiate this, that discussion through our Prelights website as well. But of course, the event today is talking about early career researchers, and early career researchers are really crucial to our Prelights community. We recently celebrated our fourth birthday, and in the four years that Prelights has been running, we've had over 300 Prelighters write for us, and the vast majority of those are PhD students and postdocs. And in just the last year, we've had representation from over 20 different countries as well. So we're really glad that our community is really international and that's something that we're really proud of too. We do recognize that writing for pre-lights is quite a big time commitment. It takes about six hours to write a pre-lights post as we found in a, re a recent survey that we took with our pre-lighters. So in return, we want to do what we can to raise the profile of our pre-lighters. And we do that in lots of different ways. And one example I've shown here is by hosting interviews with our pre-lighters and also by, high by highlighting preprints that have been written by our pre-lighters themselves. And so you can see here, we've got that interview series, Meet the Pre-lighters, and also our preprints by pre-lighters series too, as a way of raising the profile of the early career researchers who write for us. As well as that, um, prior to the pandemic, we hosted in-person meetups of pre-lighters at conferences. So you can see here, this was a conference in 2019, and you can see Mate on the right. He was our previous pre-lights community manager. And that was a great way for Mate to meet lots of pre-lighters and for pre-lighters to meet each other at these events too. But of course, in-person events have been few and far between in recent years. So we've kind of transitioned to more of a virtual networking um, system in the last year. 
So we've had these virtual meetups. We've also done some virtual um, collaborative writing events too, which have been a great way to talk about research and also for pre-lighters to meet each other, as well as for me to meet pre-lighters in our community. So I'll pass over to Esperanza, but I'll just note that if you're interested in joining the pre-lights community, then I'd be really glad to meet you in the networking uh, session afterwards, and I hope I can talk to lots of you then. As Helen said, I'm Esperanza, the, micros um, the community manager of Focal Plane, uh, which is the microscopy um, community site hosted by Journal of Cell Science. Um, so on Focal Plane, um, it's um, the online meeting place where you can find resources and information relating to microscopy. And you can also connect with the microscopy community. So uh, we're actually the youngest of the three community sites uh, and we launched in July of 2022. So similar to the other community sites, our content is driven uh, by the community. Um, so anyone can contribute uh, to Focal Plane and you just need to, um, let me see if that works. Um, you just need to create an account for free on Focal Plane and then start posting your own contributions. So here you can see the homepage of Focal Plane uh, with some of the content. And here you can find some of the blog posts uh, published by some of uh, our contributors, um, highlighting some of the techniques that they implemented in their lab or some of the tools that they uh, developed. Um, so all the content on Focal Plane, it's categorized into nine different categories that you're gonna see right here. Um, so um, what I want to highlight, because today it's an early career uh, researcher event, is that uh, contributing to Focal Plane is an excellent opportunity for you to improve your writing and science communication skills. Um, so please feel free uh, to reach to uh, me. Uh, we're gonna be at, uh, after in the networking session. So um, I'm happy to discuss any ideas of, uh, of how you can contribute to Focal Plane. Um, and uh, just want to mention here also, we also have a gallery um, where you can also post your images and we also highlight, um, pick some images from there to highlight them at the uh, front page of the home page, um, highlighting also um, the author behind the images. And um, another thing that I want to mention about Focal Plane today, it's a project that we've been working um, on in the last few months and we're really excited that it's going to be launched really soon and that is the Focal Plane Network. So uh, similar to what Helen presented about the, uh, the node network, the focal plane network is gonna be a, a global database of researchers with microscopy expertise. So um, here we hope that you can find um, any researcher, even uh, from uh, microscopy developers to image analy analysts um, and any imaging scientists uh, from any field. Um, so the aims here is that uh, we can facilitate promotion and networking of all these researchers, but also assist um, those people that are uh, looking for conference speakers, committee members, reviewers, or even potential uh, collaborators. So uh, keep an eye on um, our uh, social media channels and also on our website, because this is gonna go live uh, really soon. Um, and now what I want to do is just move uh, to our panelists for today. So we're gonna let them introduce uh, themselves and we're gonna start with uh, Maria Abu Chakra from the University of Toronto. So uh, Maria, you can turn on your camera microphone. There you go, and the stage is yours. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining today. So I'm um, a theoretical biologist. I am at the University of Toronto in Gary Bader's lab. I did my PhD at uh, McMaster in evolutionary biology. And um, today I just, um, I'm introducing myself in terms of um, points where maybe you feel uh, comfortable to ask me questions. So I wanted to highlight that as a researcher, I switched fields. So I started in evolutionary biology, which was theoretical morphology. Then as a post, my first postdoc was in evolutionary game theory, and now I'm in cell development and differentiation. So if you have questions regarding jumping fields, I'd be happy to answer. At least this is from my point of view. Um, I'm also currently the organizer of uh, the Modeling Cell Development and Regeneration Discussion Group. It's obviously not as big as the focal plane and community of biologists, but we're trying to build the community there. Um, we're hoping to also connect other theoreticians together in order so they can um, exchange resources and help one another. So it's been one year running and hopefully we can grow. Other questions? Um, I also uh, 
I like to paint and sketch. And sometimes you might find me um, sketching some papers on Twitter. It, this started in my grad school before Thai art was even, um, let's say, common. Um, so in my biology department, I used to just paint and some professors saw that and then they took that and posted it on a couple of cover pages. And now um, Twitter makes it easy to do this. And other questions you're welcome to ask me about. I'm also a mom of two. I've um, run a lot of uh, EDI conferences for bias conscious discussion groups. I also try to chair um, committees where we try to help parents to join conferences. This is, of course, when they were still in person to see how to make it more accessible for everyone. So nice to meet you all. Um, I just want to remind the attendees before we move to the next panelist um, that you can start typing your questions in the Q&A. Um, so now we're going to move to our next panelist. Um, that is Pablo Saez from UKE Hamburg. Um, so Pablo, stage is yours. Hey. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm glad to, to be here. I, I'm, I'm, I thank the organizers for the invitation. Um, I am a, a, now I am a principal investigator, but not so long ago I was probably in the other side of the of the table where several of you are. I am from Chile, uh, and I moved to France um, quite some years ago uh, for a postdoc at the Curie Institute, and then I moved for a second postdoc uh, in an, in another institution associated to the Curie, which is the IPGD. And then uh, eventually I, I found my way here to Hamburg in the north of Germany. Uh, I have been involved in, in several uh, early career researchers initiatives, such as the eLife Ambas uh, Ambassador Program, um, where we develop some, uh, some good tools for, for early career researchers to find fellowships or, or to find other ways to move around the, the academic uh, path. Uh, I help with other people to fund uh, one of the so-called junior uh, boards of the European Calcium Society. So it's just very niche specific, but the idea was to generate a parallel board of uh, young scientists that will stay for some time in the field, and then they can put a word in the topics that are important for them to the, the official board, let's say. And then I'm very happy to be a contributor of focal plane after invitation by, by Esperanza. So I would define scientifically, I have work just as life is in very different topics uh, but one of the things that is continue in all of them is, is life cell imaging so then i like to i like to see how cells do things and how especially how cells move so then this is what we study in, study in my laboratory how cells walk and talk so then communication and, and migration and i spend some of my time also uh, doing scientific communication and social media specifically in Twitter and and also I am very much into in sci science uh, art uh, participating in different sort of expo and currently we have a couple of projects around so yeah so please go ahead and I don't want to make this any longer I will be happy to to hear your questions or your to talk about to talk with you and in the tables uh, Thank you, Pablo. Uh, we're going to move now to our uh, third panelist, um, who is uh, Salvena Salabi Poor uh, from Johns Hopkins University. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me, and I'm really excited to be here as well. Uh, I am a research scientist and my work um, is around making computational models of uh, receptors in our cells uh, to see how they interact and how they uh, modulate uh, blood vessel function. Uh, so my work is currently computational, but my um, doctoral work was in experimental biophysics and biochemistry. So um, if you have questions about uh, uh, changing uh, disciplines, I'm very happy to uh, to uh, chat and um, on the side I also find it important that we uh, work to improve our research environments uh, so I have been active in uh, research culture projects and I have worked with um, Pablo actually 
um, in the past. Uh, so it's, um, it's important uh, for me to advocate for us and for um, features that uh, can help us promote our work and ourselves. Uh, I have advocated preprints, um, equitable conferencing and mentoring, and uh, would be uh, very happy to chat about those topics as well. Thank you. Thank you, um, Sarinas. And now I'm gonna welcome all the panelists um, to turn on um, their cameras and we can start maybe uh, with the discussions. So um, there are a couple of questions already. So I guess we can start with questions um, from the audience. So there's one question uh, for Maria. So um, it says, I am in the situation of shifting domains. The topic of my PhD is different from my postdoc, which I've st just started. How to jump into the new topic and start planning for publications? Um, planning for publication is probably the hardest part. I think uh, give yourself a little time to learn the new field. My The thing I do is read. I try to take a textbook. Usually it's a good source to catch up to, to this new topic. Um, and then, um, yeah, just give yourself time to learn. Usually there's a small learning curve. And in terms of publication, it will show up. Once you, once you start moving, that's probably the best way, or at least that's how I did it. Savannah, did you want to talk about that as well? I know you mentioned shifting um, yes. your topics in the intro. Um, yeah, I think the first few years are um, quite a learning curve um, when you change fields. And I think uh, it's natural to uh, feel that there is a rush to publication. I think, unfortunately, that's part of the academic culture that count, paper counts and uh, the speed of generating them uh, has become important, but in um, in the in long term, in the span of our career, uh, what we actually do, the quality of the work is very important. And I think that these positions are uh, postdoctoral positions are independent. They have to be independent positions. So we have to. I think we have to take the time to uh, read. Uh, and 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 learn as many techniques as as we need, uh, but in long term it will pay off because um, uh, in in your uh, next career stage you have uh, more tools in in your arsenal to do more interesting uh, type of work. I think. Okay, um, we have a question from Alex in the chat, um, and he's asked, have any of you got involved in something primarily to further your career, so some of your outreach work or the other publications you've worked on, but you've discovered that you actually enjoy that activity more than you'd initially expected? I wonder if any of you have an answer to that. Well, it has not been my particular case to, to be involved in, a, in, in something like this case, but what I could tell you is that if if there is anything that you enjoy more than you initially expected is something that you definitely should pursue. I mean, it sounds obvious from when this does not imply changing many things in your academic scheme or your CV and so on. If you really enjoy something, you have to give it a try. I know um, colleagues that have th tried Hindus industry for a while, and some of them have come back to science because they say, well, it's not my thing, and some others remain in industry and are very, very happy uh, doing so. And and then the last case I, I heard about this was just a couple of days, um, doing a microscopic demo, microscopy demo, the one of the so-called, um, or one of the people that was showing the microscope, they have fancy names for the title. And I asked whether, what was he doing before? And he explained me a bit and, and it was by the time in which the postdoc is ending, which of course is a, a part of the scientific life with a lot of friction. He was not feeling the support and he was trying to get the grants and so on. And then at some point he realized that he was really good and he liked to uh, make some tweaks in the microscopes. And then he was good in explaining them. And then during a demo, someone uh, told him about a position open in, in, in a company. And then he joined the company and, and the, the quote that really 
got stuck in my head is like, and after I decided to move out, I, f- I felt a great relief and I am much more happy than I was before. So and if you enjoy that, I think it's something to pursue. Just wanted to add that uh, I think it can happen that early career researchers looking to pass or previous careers for for uh, what they would like to do. And I think that um, while previous generations may have had great careers, but our career is can be unique and uh, we can craft it, we can do projects that we like um, with, with uh, support from our mentor or uh, things in our own time, we can do um, internships that may not have been available to our PIs or their PIs. And uh, it doesn't have to look like other people's careers. And I think that's more satisfying because we are not all the same. We are, each of us are very different. And it's quite fine to take time to do things that will enrich our experiences because um, others are not necessarily going to do this for us. Great. Okay, and now we have a question from uh, Dylan Bergen. He asks, uh, could you give us some tips and tricks to create your own research niches? That may be the hardest bit for ECRs, especially especially post-PhD. I don't know who wants to address that one first. Maybe, maybe I can jump in. Uh, well, that's obviously a very tricky step, right? So then it's no no wonder it's the trickiest of the. I started my lab nearly, so this is fake, but the position started two years ago, but of course I was blocked um, by the pandemics in France and then the laboratory was ready I, roughly a year ago. But still the clock is counting, so people consider that it's two years lab. Uh, the trick is, how how would I put it? The, um, regarding to, to another question as well that is around that probably jam, we'll, we will address soon it's like the same way that you are always applying for a job even if you're not looking for it there is always the opportunity that someone will look for your poster and then offer you a post position or something like that the same way you are always you should always be thinking in in bringing um, new things that you might not know fully to your expertise and to combine them. I think that is the easiest way. So then, for example, my my PhD, I work with cell communication and, and ion channels uh, in Chile, and I learn about different cellular systems, and then I, I work in, immun- in the immunity and cancer unit at the Curie, and I learn a lot about immunology, but also about cell biology. And then I moved to the cell biology department, and, and now I have my lab. And if you see the topics from my lab are a mix of all of it. <laughs> so it's something like a, a rough smoothie, it's everything. And then there is actually, you will find like this that people are not combining concepts or bringing concepts from one area to the other one, uh, which I can give you a couple of examples briefly, and, and, and using your own expertise. So one of these is, for example, uh, in the lab of Matthew Piel in, at the Curie, where I was working in the mobile team. Uh, by by another researcher, uh, also Chilean, named Pablo Vargas. And uh, the team of Matthew Piel was is, is a very strong team in, in modeling and, and proposing phys- physical models for, for explaining cellular behavior. But there, at the time, there was no models to predict uh, cell communication without doing the experiments, just by cellular behavior. So then some other physicists approached us at a at, at seminar, and, and Matthew was generous enough to say like yeah but this guy is the one that knows about cell communication what do you talk to him and then we came out with a new idea to generate a model based on cell migration data analyze the behavior and and see predict possible communication and this is something that you you will see uh, opportunities like that all the time and of course the first grants will be very similar to what you used to hear the last years of your training before you start your own lab or postdoc, for example. Uh, but then those a slight difference at the beginning, then on time, because you are embedded in a different community, they are gonna make a larger difference on, on time. So then you start differentiating a little bit, and then you will see after one or two years, it will be, it will look much more different than you will have.
I can add something. Um, so from my opinion, I, I don't know how you can actually identify a niche, but maybe you can start by finding something you love. As far as I'm concerned, a PhD sort of gave me the rights to think and ask questions. Um, so you're not really defined by your, um, let's say, field per se. And so um, my advice would be to read and keep asking questions and somehow you'll, you'll hit on something that you can't stop thinking about. And that could be a good sign that it's a nice area or something that you're interested in. And then try to be good at it. I think yeah, that would be the, my advice. I agree with Maria and Pablo. I think um, what you decide to do in your PhD can very much influence you. But I think that uh, it's not all the time you have in the world. You have other stages of your career and you might as well go and do something else equally interesting. Um, I did go to a lot of seminars uh, when I was a graduate student in many departments. <laughs> um, I think that biological research, biomedical research is very interdisciplinary. So I felt that I could listen to chemists, engineers, biologists, and I think that really inspired me to not be inhibited into one specific area of research. And also felt that I can look into other fields and see if those are the things that I want to do in the future. Um, so I think people around us, their science can really inspire us. And now there are a lot of um, virtual webinars and conferences and seminar series. So uh, there is a, a much lower barrier, I think, which is fantastic to be influenced much early on and, and to decide uh, both in terms of type of career and, and the type of research or non-research academic work that you want to do in the future or uh, something completely different non-academic that you decide to do later. Let me move to the next question. Uh, there's no name here, so I don't know who uh, typed the question, but um, he or she asked, what they uh, what ways have you promoted yourself as an ECR when you have not had an established line of research? Well, I think uh, maybe I can start for this uh, and, and related to maybe the next question is coming. Then when you start applying for jobs, as I said earlier, you are in a way in any meeting or Congress or interaction seminar, you are always without knowing there is a job opportunity there. And the same for promoting yourself. It sometimes is hard, for, especially for introvert people or shy people, to jump and address the, the speakers and ask questions. But this is probably the best way to to start promoting yourself. So then it, it took me. Uh, it, it takes a while, and it took me some time to realize that uh, going one by one is one option. But uh, so. One option is to ask the question in the seminar room with a lot of people. And maybe you are not very comfortable with that. But another way is just after the seminar or something, you just send an email and say, like, great talk. I, I like what you show. And have you thought about A, B, C, D? And then people will start interacting. And this is already a way to promote yourself because then people will see if they are looking for a, a person for whatever, an interview, uh, an example to go and, and explain kids in the school in the high school, uh, how what what your research lines is, then people will think about that. Yeah, but I just recently met this person in the seminar, and it seems that might be interesting. Why not give it a try? And this is in within a community. This is the first way. And in now, especially in these pandemics, uh, reaching out people by sending emails, message, or in whatever platform you're using is the easiest way. And then you will see then people might be responsive or not. And then this is already a way to select which interactions might be prolific or, or better to change to another. Um, I can say that it can be hard, of course, when you're just starting, but being confident is important, which means that um, you are already working with other scientists, so you are selected for your abilities, and that's very important. So um, that's really a lot of what you need to start discussions. And um, as mentioned, asking questions is, is a great way. You can um, get to know people from other parts of the world. Um, 
luckily there are a lot of open science initiatives or communities uh, many of them uh, actually have no injury barrier and the ones um, that Helen uh, discussed today uh, and Anna Esperanza in, uh, with Company of Biologists are, are just one example but really great examples and uh, so there are a lot of avenues to, to be engaged I think and uh, these can be about research but also can be about other parts of um, research environments and you get to know people and then later that network may be helpful but it, it doesn't necessarily have to be that network I think if you choose supportive mentors that uh, can also be really helpful because there's a limit to self-promotion and it is it can be very helpful if if other colleagues also sometimes uh, introduce you or, or recommend you to, to other people. did you want to add or shall I move on to the next question? I can add if it's okay. Yeah, sure. I, I was just going to, I'm actually, uh, I feel really awkward going up to anybody or talking to PIs, or at least I did initially. And I just wanted to say to anybody who feels they're not sure what to do, I think you have to think, or at least I learned that PIs are normal people. <laughs> and if you wanted to talk to someone, just approach them. If they're willing to talk back, then that tells you more than one thing, right? They're nice. You're, you might be able to work with them. And if they run away from you or don't give you the time of day, then maybe you may not want to work with them. So um, it also works. You're also choosing your path and don't worry about just trying to please someone. Also try to make your path the right way because you don't want to end up in a lab where you're, you're not comfortable with the person or you can't talk to them. Um, at least that's my advice and somehow it, it works out. Yes, it takes time and it's very awkward to, to meet people, but uh, I think the virtual settings has, has made it easier. And if somebody's approachable, you will know. I, I think just, it's just do that first step, putting yourself out there. Yeah, I think kind of leading on that, I'm gonna combine two questions into one because I think they're sort of aiming to the same point. So. Firstly, do you have any advice for approaching PIs? I know you just talked about this a little bit, Maria, um, to ask about new opportunities or joining their groups. That's from Lucy. And she says, I've heard from others that it's common for positions not to be advertised. And then similarly, we've got another question asking, um, what advice would you give to people looking for a laboratory to do their PhD in, especially when they want to move to a different country or move from one place to the other? So I guess, firstly, how do you identify the lab that you might want to work in? And then how do you go about approaching the PI when you want to speak to them? I guess I could move, I can keep going from that. I mean, it is really hard to know exactly where, what is gonna be the response, but I guess putting yourself out there. Nowadays, it's a little easier. You'll see a lot of PIs advertising on Twitter um, and on the, lot of, on the community sites. There's a lot of advertisements. I don't know if um, there are the non-advertised um, openings as much as they used to be, um, but it doesn't hurt to try. Um, I got lucky, to be honest. Uh, there was a, I'll just tell you my story. As a PhD, I finished and I had no way, I didn't know where to go. I also studied a strange, um, well, the organism was very common. It was a sea urchin, but I was a theoretician modeling sea urchins. And besides paleontologists, nobody really cared about the topic. And so it was really hard to know who's going to want to hire me. Um, but the first step was basically to show not my topic, but more my skills. So if you're worried about um, what the prof wants, maybe advertise your skills. I, I knew that I was good at modeling. I knew that I can do really hard um, topics and I wasn't afraid to jump. And uh, I think that's sort of what, you know, helped me move from one place to the, to the other. Um, but uh, that's just, I guess, my, my journey. Um, I think that uh, there are uh, avenues to look for postings apart from the PI. And so a uh, job archive is, is a new um, platform that uh, people can post all types of uh, jobs from PhD, uh, lab tech, uh, postdoctoral and, and faculty. And it's free to access and free to post. 
and uh, also communities such as um, Company of Biologists have um, job boards and, and scientific societies also um, in, in specific disciplines that you're interested in have job boards. Um, and um, I think it, you have to put yourself out there and sometimes it may take quite a few emails to um, actually get a response because people that post these jobs may be very um, busy or maybe receiving um, tens or hundreds of applications. But I think um, eventually it will work out because there, there aren't just a few people doing a particular type of research. And, and um, most experiences are very valuable. So I think it's not a, um, it's, it, it should be very exciting, the entire process, I think, and, and it will work out great, I think. <laughs> I want to, I agree with what uh, Maria and, and Sarvenas just said, and I want to say a comment that I received recently in a, in a discussion I opened regarding this um, forum, and then one said what uh, Maria said actually, so then you have to advocate for yourself because no one else can do better than you. So then first, first of all, first mission is to know which are your skills, and, and then start a conversation around them. And this will open maybe a, another conversation with someone. And even if the position is not um, open yet, then you will get to know only by talking to people, by communicating to them, you will get to know that maybe the position is not open yet because the money did not arrive yet. But next year, uh, there will be an opening because they just got a grant. And these things take takes time, a lot of time, actually. And um, sometimes you find a fellowship that starts in two, three months, but this is exceptional. Uh, in general, you plan in a, ahead. And one way of choosing uh, the laboratory where you will go work uh, later on, for example, is to, well, for sure, interacting with people. But when this interaction occurs, uh, ask the right questions. That is very important. And I tell everyone, by even the, the interviews I have here in my lab, I always ask. So then at the end of the interview, there is a moment in which they can ask me whatever is important for them. And then they will see. And then and be bold about the questions, really be bold about what you're asking. Really has to, you have to be picky and say, like, I really wanna know about this and so on. Different examples, if, I, if it is a competitive lab, you would get to know this only by asking the people how is about the project, how much overlap are between the different projects and so on. And then you will get to know that there is a super competitive lab. And then, if you agree with that and you would like to go anywhere there, but then you go. If you don't agree with this um, culture, then you rather go elsewhere. So, and also uh, it's very hard to know from far, from people that are moving. It, it was the, the case for me. I was at the end of the world and I wanted to, to come to, to Europe to a lab. And, and actually I was choosing just by the topic and I, I had the chance to meet this researcher in a meeting, but I went specifically to a meeting because I knew this researcher will be there. And, and I met I met her and the interaction was good. So then I, I felt that it was a good place to first do an internship. So then I did an internship and that was already a clue of how the lab works and, and the institution as well. But then this is very dynamic and people move every year, the labs are changing. And then when I arrived, even the lab was almost 50% different. So there is no real, way in which can you can ensure that the interaction will be as you expected and then it's a leap of faith at, at the end you have to make a bet and really follow your gut um, considering that during meetings for example in-person meetings people will be in a very positive cheer mode <laughs> so then I, I generally used to tell people to ask for example when they ask me what should i ask one key question would be how this person or the lab behaves when things go wrong. Not when you are celebrating a paper because everyone is happy, but what happened if something broke or someone messed up someone else's experiment. And this is gonna give you a clue about how the lab culture is. Thanks, okay, so kind of changing gears a little bit. So aside from research, um, as you all introduced yourselves, it's clear that you do a lot of um, work outside of your, your research. Um, 
And so I wanted uh, the, one of the questions is referring to how do you manage to juggle and prioritize all these different activities and do you place different amounts of importance on the, the different activities? How do you how do you balance all that? Let's start. I mean, I, I think priority, I do put uh, like I put them in order. Um, but one advice I had or not advice, I, I think I listened to a TED conference once and um, the speaker had said that um, if, for instance, um, you never find time for anything, think of um, what you need to get done as a broken pipe in your house. And then all of a sudden you have time to fix it because you wouldn't have had time to do something. And so now the way I prioritize myself is see what I need um, to get done and uh, think of them as like, you know, priorities that I need to fix them. And uh, I go through my list and I think things work that way. Having kids actually teaches you that your time is <laughs> very valuable. So you, you can work really well in 15 minute gaps. But, uh, that's a different story. It is an, an important point because if the, the attendees, they don't have kids or family for the moment, and then at some point they will, and then that's going to be a jump in efficiency for sure. But how do you do that now? I, I really am really, I'm, I think I'm not really good in prioritizing. That, that's for sure. I, I, I over, normally oversell myself and normally interact with much more people and start much more projects than I actually can have. So then I, that means that I sleep less hours. Uh, is this good? No, I'm try improving every time a bit. So then now I, instead of saying no, because I'm really interested in what I do and people sometimes they reach out and say like, we saw this or that paper and we'd like to do this with you. Now, instead of saying no, I say, not now. Um, and then this has helped me a lot because I don't want to, sometimes I say, no, I'm, I think you should rather go someone else. And this is also an important part that some of, sometimes instead of doing the thing by yourself, you just hand it over to someone else that might be interested and have the time to do it. And, and this I did um, before leaving Chile. I had already, for example, I, I have got my postdoc and people, probably the community, just as I said, by talking to people, then they will talk to someone else. And all of a sudden, I, I started receiving postdoc offers when I was already leaving. And, and then I say, like, thank you very much for your offer, but I'm leaving. I already got a postdoc, of, a postdoc job elsewhere. And I was handing it over to someone else. And the same for it with collaborations or priorities. Sometimes you could do it, but also you could hand it over to someone else that can do it. And then you keep really what is more interesting for you. And, and as Maria said, you you keep the pipelines running and and that's the, the first mission. All the rest is an egg. Um, I just want to say that I agree that uh, time management can be helpful, but also uh, that management can be variable over week. Um, but if you happen to monitor how you manage your tasks, um, there are this, for example, or if you plot your work schedule and your other activities, you may over time find habits that you find useful or things that you can drop over a year or six months. And I think studying your, your, uh, your work schedule and life can be helpful. Um, also, help. Um, I have done work in teams. Um, just ideas, uh, you work asynchronously and sometimes you are busy, they can work on things and um, vice versa. Uh, and um, also it's, um, I like Pablo's idea on uh, saying no at the present, but coming back to it, you can define projects over a year or two, uh, so you don't have to do it this month or next month. And I think most people will understand that and uh, and it will be interesting. And also over time, you may find other insights that you may not have today. So it, it could be uh, quite beneficial for the project when, when it's done. I guess 
Um, leading on from that, I just spotted this in the chat. I think it's quite interesting, kind of related to what we're talking about, about prioritizing things then. Um, someone's asked, I once knew a PI who said they didn't hire people who have hobbies. So during an interview, how do I show that I am also passionate about something other than science without seeming unfocused? I think that's a really interesting question. I wondered if any of you had an answer to that. I can say that this is first, uh, I never heard about this before. And I think it's, it's actually the wrong. So then if someone would say this, so then uh, it, if this would be an exclusive, uh, um, if this situation, so then ha having hobbies, so if you have a hobby and that will prevent you to go for a job, you should be grateful. Because if someone does not appreciate that you have a hobby, um, you rather don't go to that place. I think, I truly believe in, and, and I ask the people for the lab, so then, not only because human resources will search after me, but holidays are mandatory. They need to take them uh, and, and also spend time out of the lab. So then and having hobbies actually is a great way of uh, settling down the whole aesthetic, sometimes convulsive, chaotic uh, love life. And then you settle down and you have some anchor points. And then when things are going uh, wrong in the lab because the experiments are not working or the code is not running and, and everything, which is gonna happen. You might wanna make it either short or not so deep in the valley. And the things that are gonna keep you out of the of getting crazy is um, your family, friends, or beloved ones, and your hobbies. So then I think having hobbies is, I would say in my case, is almost the opposite, it's mandatory. I always ask people to what they do and what they like to do and try to push them forward. There are some that like art. There was one that stopped doing some stuff and now he started to do handball again. They need to, people need to think. And actually most of the few so-called great ideas had, I, I have, uh, they happened when I was not in the lab <laughs> and when I was not writing a grant. They happen in some other place, just a light bulb. And then I got an idea. So yeah, hobbies are absolutely necessary in life outside the lab for sure. I guess I can chime in. I mean, I understand that um, I think it's a it's a past uh, point of view where we have to be focused on on research only. And at least as a grad student, I still remember when I applied to grad school. One of my bad points, I guess, about me that the committee had said that I was dispersed. I was into too many things. I'm interested in too many things. And I don't know if people still see it that way as a bad thing. I mean, back then it, it was seen as, how will she know what to do with, for her research? She's not focused. Um, but uh, I think that didn't work against me. Maybe that helped me jump fields. But uh, also uh, my art, I think I showed you that in 2004, and that might clock me, <laughs> that I used to faint. But nobody saw as, oh, cool, she does sci art. And you know, my paintings were about um, the different model organisms, but nobody nobody really pointed that out. I was lucky that my supervisor and another um, early career uh, scientist also saw that and then used my paintings as as the covers. But I was I never felt that that was a good point. And and just recently, I see that the, I'm, I'm happy to see that there's more about people who do sci art. There's more promoting um, these initiatives. And I think you should find something you love and be proud of it. And if it makes you feel good, um, science is about thinking. And if you don't have, give yourself the time to think, and that could be as Pablo said, it's not during the lab time. It could be when you're doing something else and it frees your mind and all of a sudden, you know, that idea pops. Um, so you need to give the time to think and finding an activity, I think is a good way. Um, I agree. I think that um, we are not one dimensional and we have a lot of things and um, research careers are so six, seven years for one particular career stage. Um, and I think that it's important to value other people's opinion in academia, but we don't live through them. <laughs> we, we live for ourselves and what we think is quite valuable and what we do is quite valuable. So not everything has to um, go through or imagined or taught through a PI. Um, there, 
or other colleagues their opinion uh, is valuable but we can confidently do what we like as well which which is quite a few things not just um, bench work or computational work Okay, unfortunately, we're coming up to an hour. I think we'd like to thank all of the participants for your brilliant questions, and we are sorry that we can't get to them all, but um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our panelists, Pablo, Maria, and Savannah. It's been brilliant. You've raised some really great points, and thank you very much for, for attending our panel today. Um, yeah, and I look forward to meeting some of you in our networking session now. <laughs>